Hi everyone, I'm Eugene Chua. I'm a philosophy PhD student at the University of California, San Diego. I primarily work on philosophy of physics, but I also work in other parts of philosophy, such as the history and philosophy of science, form epistemology, and metaphysics. Let me share some of my recent work with you on some difficulties with saying that time emerges from no time. To begin, this is a conceptual issue at the heart of quantum gravity. That is, the search for a theory which would adequately combine quantum mechanics, our best theory of matter, with general relativity, our best theory of gravity. One of the major approaches to quantum gravity involves the canonical approach, which seeks to quantize gravitational fields similar to the quantization of classical mechanics. Within general relativity, where the domain of inquiry typically involves four-dimensional space-time, one instead adopts a 3 plus 1 Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity, decomposing space-time into leaves of space-like hypersurfaces. Trouble arises because general relativity is a constrained Hamiltonian system. Now, one of the constraints is due to general relativity's time reparameterization freedom. We can foliate space-time in many different ways. This imposes constraints on the Hamiltonian for this system. Among other things, this leads us to the wheeler dewitt equation. Here's a schematic picture of the equation. H is the Hamiltonian for the system, and psi is the equivalent of the wave function representing the universe. Note that this is equivalent to zero. It vanishes. Contrast this to the standard Schrodinger equation. One notices that time vanishes in the sense that there is no dynamical evolution of the wave function for gravity as compared to the usual dynamical evolution of the wave function in time for matter in ordinary QM. This is one of the main problems of time, the so-called frozen formalism problem. For this problem, the dynamics of the system vanishes. If this is taken to be the fundamental equation of our universe, then one natural interpretation, though not the only one, is that our world is really fundamentally timeless. But this runs counter to our physical intuitions. We observe the passing of time. So how does this fundamentally timeless picture recover our experience of a world evolving in time? Against this background, a cluster of approaches appear to resolve it neatly, the internal time approach. The core claim here is, even with a fundamentally timeless ontology, if we can find a subsystem within the timeless universe that can act like a clock with respect to other systems, then we might find dynamical equations for those systems with respect to this clock. Enter the semi-classical time approach. The core idea here is that time emerges approximately in the sense that we can recover something like a Schrodinger type equation when we apply the appropriate semi-classical approximation techniques on the fundamentally timeless equation. Time shows up with a squint in a way such that we can separate the gravitational components from the matter components and use the gravitational field as a clock for the matter fields. The Schrodinger type equation then ticks along with this clock. Now, what sort of approximations are we talking about here? Anderson counts 20 or so, but we'll focus on three, which feature prominently. They have all proven extremely successful in standard quantum mechanics. But let's see whether they'll work out in this new timeless context. Now, let's start with generic but nice wave functional representing matter and gravity. But wait, our first approximation comes in here. It is crucial that the wave functional is in an eigenstate. That is, we can ignore superposed states of the wave function of the universe. Otherwise, the program does not get going at all. Kucha gives a long list of problems associated with the superposition problem, or so it's called. For many technical reasons, the derivation might not even work out. But even if it did, it would lead to multiple different time functions which may not be congruent with each other. But in classical quantum mechanics, physicists often assume decoherence. What this says, roughly, is that even if the universe started out in some generic superposition of states, they quickly decohere, or branch, such that these branches become approximately independent of each other given the Schrodinger equation. So let's help ourselves to it too. Even if our universe started out in a messy superposition of many states of the universe, we should expect to be in one of these definite branches due to decoherence. And so we can safely ignore the other branches for the purposes of recovering time for our universe. Now, we demand our nice wave functional here can be treated with the born oppenheimer approximation. Essentially, we demand that a wave function can be factorized into two parts, which we'll call the light wave function, which responds to and depends on the both matter phi and gravity h, and a heavy wave function, which is independent of matter phi. 
The intuitive physical reasoning here is that we do not expect quantum gravitational effects except near the Planck scale. So gravity is essentially blind to quantum goings on. Similarly, the heavy H A B depends on the extremely small Planck mass. So the idea of separating scales seems to be natural for now. Importantly, the idea here is to use the Habe system as a clock for the light system. Now, if we can do this, then we next apply the wenzel kramers brion approximation on the Habe part, or what is commonly called as a WKB approximation. Note, though, that this state is also assumed to be an eigenstate, so we already need the coherence here as well. Starting with where we left off, we replace chi with the ansatz of a form AIS. That is, we assume that the heavy wave function can be represented as an exponential form. Typically, we justify this answer by assuming that we can neglect the 2 way dx squared. For this to be true, v must vary slowly with x, and e minus v cannot be too small. When v is constant, and the system behaves like a free particle, a is constant, and so the condition here is true. We'll get more to it later. Here, we are assuming that the heavy wave functional is essentially interacting with a slow or non-existent potential, and so it is effectively independent of the light wave functional. Now, on the face of it then, we are allowed to assume WKB as well. Now what happens next is pretty gnarly, but with a lot of mathematics, one could use the action term mass to derive what is called a WKB time. This is similar to how one could introduce a time parameter in the hamilton jacobi theory using surfaces of constant s. Now, using this term, we derive the time derivative of psi to be the derivative with respect to HAB and its derivative with respect to WKB time. That is, with respect to the heavy system playing the role as a clock. Now, with more math, we can get something like this out of that previous equation. H is here a Hamiltonian type term. Note that it looks a lot like a Schrodinger equation. And as the saying goes, if it looks like a duck and acts like a duck, Perhaps we can say that WKB time really is time as we know it. And the T in the Schrodinger equation that we know and love. But wait, we've just used a bunch of different approximations, each justifying their own ways in physical contexts. Are they justified here? Approximations require physical justification. At the level of pure math, of course, one can derive virtually any equation for any other if we are allowed to assume anything at all. It makes no sense to say that one equation of quantity is close to another absent a metric. We need a justification, and it is in this justification that we fear that time sneaks in. Now, for instance, we can treat classical pendulums as approximately undamped harmonic oscillators. For small angles, sine theta approximates theta, allowing us to derive equations of motions for pendulums which are identical to those of harmonic oscillators. So in this sense, a harmonic oscillator emerges from the pendulum in the small angle limit. But this is only relative to some measurement standards. At some point, the displacement angle becomes too big and the approximation fails. We know these deviations from the derived equations of motion. Angles are not intrinsically big or small. They are big or small relative to a standard. Typically, the standard refers to the observational and measurement capacities of an observer and so the approximation's validity hangs partly on the error analysis of our measurement technique. Coarse measurements allows the approximation to be good for greater values of theta than finer measurements. Now what I will argue now is this. The approximations used to derive semi-classical time are always warranted in the rest of physics by appeal to an implicit time metric. Without this time metric, the approximations seem physically unwarranted. Now what we can't do is to show that there is no possible standard warranting these approximations. What we can do here is to raise the worry and to challenge advocates of semi-classical time to justify these approximations without appealing to a prior time standard. Without that, it seems like there is no time for time from no time. Let's look at the first approximation again, decoherence. Our worry is especially clear here because decoherence is normally understood as a dynamical process occurring as a result of temporal evolution by the Schrodinger equation. But decoherence at once requires time because of this, but it's also required for time so that we can actually derive the semi-classical time. One finds this tension in Kiefer's work on the semi-classical approximation. He's one of the major proponents of this theory. He writes that a prerequisite of decoherence in the semi-classical time program is the validity of the semi-classical approximation. 
this brings an approximate time parameter t into play. So we might think that decoherence needs time. But later he writes that since decoherence is a prerequisite for the derivation of the Schrodinger equation, the one that we saw just now from WKB time, one might even say that WKB time arises from symmetry breaking, or what he means by decoherence. And strictly speaking, the very concept of time makes sense only after decoherence has occurred. This suggests that time needs decoherence. So it seems like we are not yet justified to use decoherence. Time needs decoherence, and decoherence needs time. So which came first, or which is justifying which? Now even if we put that aside somehow, we find that the von Oppenheimer approximation too implicitly assumes a background time for its application. The von Oppenheimer approximation, or what I'll simply call BO, is motivated by appealing to the very different scales that the gravitational fields and matter fields have. This appeals to some metric measuring how big the effects of one system is on the other. Now, why does having different size masses warrant different scales and factorizing the wave function as we did just now? Differences in the value of other properties, say charge, do not always demand or legitimize such an approximation. What is special about mass? To help answer this question, let us look at standard uses of BO outside quantum gravity. Unfortunately, we'll find that mass and size scale differences between systems are only relevant for BO because they are proxies for time scale differences in the dynamics of the relevant subsystems. In its most popular application, molecular and atomic physics, BO is used to factorize an atom or molecule's wave function into the product of two subsystems. Here, the heavier subsystem is the nuclei, and the lighter subsystem is the electron surrounding the nuclei. But, and here's the crucial part, the typical justification relies on the fact that the heavier nuclei can be assumed to be effectively dynamically independent of the lighter subsystem, while the lighter system rapidly adapts itself to changes in the heavier system. More generally, BO applies in cases where heavier subsystems are known to change slowly in time with respect to lighter subsystems. This is why mass matters. Heavier subsystems have significantly different characteristic dynamical timescales, timescales over which the parameter of the system changes appreciably and can be said to be adiabatic with respect to the lighter subsystems. The change in the lighter subsystem happens on such a short time scale that there is not enough time for the heavier subsystem to react in that relevant time scale. And so it is effectively independent of lighter subsystems in that period of time. And this is why we can motivate the BO factorization. The different masses are proxies for dynamical time scale differences. So it seems that implicitly BO is directly laden with temporal notions. Now returning to a semi-classical time program, a problem arises. Because BO is so widely used, and because it initially seems to be about mass and not time, it may be important to derivations without considering whether its use in new applications is warranted. Did that happen here? Now, we cannot say for sure, but I will leave you with a dilemma. Either the mass scales relevant here are proxies for time scales, or they're not. If they are, there's a security problem. If they are not, we have no clear means yet of assessing whether BO is even applicable here. In short, this seems to be a case of needing time to get time. But of course, in the canonical context, we have no time for that yet. Finally, let us look at WKB. It's commonly presented as a piece of PR math, and it seems like a mere approximation method in theory of partial differential equations, and a likely place to find a hidden time preference. But of course, we still need physical justifications for why this math applies to a given physical situation. For that, we need physics. We believe that the approximation presumes the existence of time. But let's see how this goes. We see this most clearly with the textbook WKB derivation. Begin with the one-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation, or the TISE, describing a system in the background potential Vx. Let's rewrite it like this, using the classical momentum identity for P. Now, if Vx is constant, the system behaves like a free particle with its wave function proportional to an exponential form like this. If Vx varies slowly enough, we expect that the system behaves approximately like a free particle, like this. Now, motivated by this intuition, we find solutions to the TISE such that they satisfy these answers. It turns out that we can find these solutions if we assume that A varies so slowly with x that we can treat this derivative as vanishingly small. 
Under what conditions are we allowed to neglect D2A dx squared? And what are the physical justifications? This is where the physics enters. The conditions are well known. V must vary slowly with x, and E minus V cannot be too small. As mentioned before, when V is constant, the system behaves like a free particle. And then A is constant. But when V is varying slowly, so too is A. So where's the time in this? On the face of it, the condition of V slowly varying does not conceal any time dependence because it concerns slowness with respect to the spatial x and not the temporal t. What motivates WKB then? It's that when the potential is not too spatially sharp, one tends to not see much interference. So this important assumption is about spatial smoothness and not temporal variation. But wait, what does it mean for potential V to vary slowly with respect to x? If the potential spatially varies slowly with respect to the particle's wavelength, or the de Broglie wavelength, then its wave function approximates that of free particle. But what this means is precisely that the system will propagate freely with a constant velocity v for a time t. So this relation holds, where L is the scale of variation of the potential. This provides a clear physical picture of what it means to apply a WKB. It's not just math. If L is long and v is low, then the particle is moving slowly through an effectively unchanging v, allowing our approximation to hold for long times. Conversely, if L is short and v is high, then the particle rapidly moves in time through the potential. In these cases, we can no longer assume that v is effectively constant for the system, and WKB would not hold for long times. Using the De Broglie relation, we can furthermore write this equation as such. The time dependence, evident when talking about velocities and momenta, becomes masked when we replace velocities with notions of wavelengths and spatial variations. Yet the time dependence is plainly there. From this equation, you can see that if L is large, then the WKB approximation will be good for long t. And if it's small, then only for short t. In standard cases then, WKB is thus justified via background time metric even though we do not see it explicitly. In the case of semi-classical time, however, there is no such background time metric, so the dilemma returns. We once again face our challenge to justify the assumption without invoking time. So, summing up, we saw how the semi-classical time program relies on three crucial approximations, decoherence, von Oppenheimer, and WKB. Together, they're supposed to show how time approximately emerges from a fundamentally timeless world, through the semi-classical approximations. If we squint enough, time arises and emerges in the form of something that looks like the Schrodinger equation. But we also just saw that they each assume time in their justifications in their own ways. While they are indeed justified in the standard physical context, these justifications do not yet carry over to the timeless context. So the semi-classical time program cannot yet justify the claim that time emerges from no time. So we appear stuck with the problem of time for now, at least for this program. The difficulty of saying that time emerges from no time remains. If you're interested in a more thorough version of this argument, please check out our paper and references therein in the link below. In the future, I hope to work out how other programs fare in response to the problem of time as well. Thank you for watching.